Are you planning to move to a new location anytime soon? Sean Larkin here for Crime and Place, the iPhone app that helps you stay aware and stay safe. Crime and Place will provide you with FBI crime rates for any location. It can even tell you about specific property or personal crime rates. It's easy to use and it's free to download. Before you go anywhere, go to crimeandplace.com. Stay aware, stay safe with Crime and Place. Wow. Um, Howard, how you doing today, buddy? I'm doing fantastic, Sean. How so, are you doing today? I'm, I'm great. Um, we'll, we'll talk about your, your research you're doing on the computer here in a little bit. But uh, anyways, man, we have got a, uh, a great guest here today, a guy who has actually been on the social media scene for quite a while. Um, kind of funny. I've actually run into different people, uh, God, even here in Tulsa, that – talk about following a, a certain guy he's been to prison he talks about what it's like and you know has this long this, this large um, following on social media and you know i was like oh yeah i know a guy that d- does the same thing his name is big hurt and they're like yeah that's him and i'm like man i grew up with that guy they're like no fucking way so yeah <laughs> big hurt uh, i knew him as marcus newhouse back in the day uh ended up later changing his last name back to his mother's maiden name i believe and marcus timmons yeah, um, but that's our guest we have here today. It's a guy that, I mean, we literally grew up together in the city of San Francisco. Uh, he's going to have some phenomenal stories for us. Well, hey, it, it's a pleasure to have you on today. Should I call you Big? Should I call you Big Herc? Should I call you uh, Herc? Everybody just call me either Big Herc or Herc. All right, we'll call you Herc then. That sounds good to me. Well, welcome. We're we're glad you're here. So uh, I am kind of new to this relationship. I am the outsider, I guess. How'd you meet Sean? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, we forgot something. We got, we forgot something. Marcus, uh, I'm just going to call you Marcus. That's what you're always yeah. going to be to me. And listen, I'm going to say this for those that are listening to this, driving in their car, uh, listening to it at work, working out or whatever. Uh, there is a reason he goes by Big Herc. Um, he is well-spoken. He has a soft voice, even a, like a minor lisp, I almost even say from time to time. <laughs> but don't. Don't mistake this. Let me tell you, Marcus is a big fucking dude. He's the real deal. Uh, we'll kind of get into that a little bit here. But uh, here on our podcast, it is called Cocktails and Cocktails, and therefore we have to have a drink while we while we bullshit and talk. Um, and so, being Marcus and I grew up in the on the West Coast, uh, in the you know the Bay Area, the city of San Francisco. He moved out to Sacramento. I moved to a suburb called Fairfield. But this was during the you know late 80s, early 90s when gangsters exploded. Talked about that before. Malt liquor was a big thing. Growing up as a teenager, I was drinking either St. Ives or King Cobra, old, old English 800 and stuff like that. So King Cobra, we couldn't find it in a bottle form, but we did find it in some big-ass tall boys. So we are going to drink some malt liquor uh, that back in high school, we would get 99-cent quarts, bottles for 99 cents of this. And uh, and drink, but here's to uh, here's yeah. to you, Mister Herc. Yeah, Marcus, what are you drinking? And, and I have water. You know, water, I was yeah. a gangster. I've never drank a forty ounce in my life. Never smoked a blunt. Mm. But um, I eat a lot of oatmeal and do a lot of protein <laughs> shakes. So I was kind of like the uh, they called me the square gangster because I never really got into any of the other stuff. No, uh, well, uh, like I said, we will get into all this. But you know, Marcus, when we were, I mean, he was he was smart. He was always. Um, I don't know if I use the word prog- progressive. He was always thinking ahead, man, as a, as a youngster. And uh, just, you know, the path that you ended up going down, uh, it's just kind of funny to me, you know, I guess in that sense. Because you were always like the smart dude, the leader of the, the group of guys we ran around with. That actually isn't too bad, is it? It's cold. <laughs> it's cold, but that's – we uh huh. we've had it's better than apple crown i'll go with that yeah better, than, better right. than apple crown all right i got a question how'd you two meet how old were you where were you what were you doing um you look into his big long neck eyes and go hey i want to be a friend <laughs> we actually um shit man third grade sean was in second grade yeah something like that yeah something like we, we <clears throat> back in early 80s and um he lived right around the corner on a military base treasure island mm-hmm. which is uh they they've changed it now but back in the day treasure island was a naval base and it had coast guard and uh we lived right around the corner from each other and all the kids played outside our um all the parents knew each other and naturally you know if you lived on the same block you guys became friends 
And uh, me and Sean, you know, uh, just naturally just kind of gravitate toward each other. And then we had, if, then we had brothers that were almost the same age. So they hung out a little bit. And then, and then we ended up having baby sisters that are almost like a little bit, I think, age too. So, and then we played little league baseball. I mean, dude, we played, we, there was so much going on on base, man. And, and he kind of was a little bit younger than me, I think by a year. So he was kind of like a little brother because he was closer to my age and we hung out. But there were a lot of big kids. So you always try to find like somebody to shadow on the base that kind of like take you under their wing. And he was like, he was like my friend. And we always, we just kind of took a liking to each other. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, we, his mom was a, uh, she used to cut hair if I remember correctly. Yep. yep. She'd cut yep. hair. Sheila. And yep. uh, I remember, remember, remember still, still to this day. And this is back. I remember when like ColecoVision came out and the video <laughs> games were like a big deal. <laughs> Yeah, we had in television. Yeah, yeah. So we would uh, we try to play video games back in the day. But yeah, when Marcus and I were younger, man, and uh, you know we went through middle school together, and he was a year older, and 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 we went to it's called Dr. Martin Luther King Junior Academic Middle School. Was this on Treasure Island? Was this on the base? No, it wasn't. This was actually you know out in the city of San Francisco, and um, you know this was out by kind of near the old Candlestick Park that used to be out there, and uh, there was a street called Third Street, and. I don't know what it's like to this day, but back then it was like the rough part of San Francisco. And uh, it was kind of nestled between another area called Hunter's Point or HP yeah. as I called it. And uh, I don't know, what was it? Maybe a 20, 25 minute bus ride for us every day or something like that. I mean, you get stuck in traffic. Hell, you'd be on the highway for literally an hour and a half, two hours. Oh, you know, remember cool. on the way to school too, Sean, um, you couldn't be you couldn't be no soft ass on that bus because remember they would cap on you the yeah. whole way yep. and I mean like the big kids on base they were bullies yep. I mean dude they would bully it wasn't no I mean dude people would get beat up on a bus and you know uh, just mentally abused <laughs> by the time you got to school I mean <laughs> dude and then you had to ride home with these kids and um, dude they would cap on you for a whole hour and um, by the time we got to school and the thing is. When we got to school, we got kind of uh, capped on too because we were on a military base. So they call us, remember, T-I-Y-B-I kids. Yep. Like, oh, you little T-I kids. Like, they thought we were soft because our parents were in the military. And all these kids back then, I mean, I didn't really know, you know, in retrospect, but these guys were already, some of them selling drugs, hustlers. I mean, these kids, remember they had shot like the starter jackets and stuff. I, I mean, I don't know how they afforded the stuff. Yeah, I was just going to say, this was back in the era of, like, Adidas and Puma sweatsuits, yep. shell yep. clues, you know, like Run DMC was oh, wearing, yeah. the starter jackets. I got jumped. So so Marcus and I went to MLK when it was the old, old school. So I think, like, one floor was middle school, and the other two floors were the high yep. school. Yeah. Oh, so, damn. <laughs> oh, seriously, man. So, I mean, yeah. you're going to school with 18-year-olds, you know, at the same school, essentially. And like I said, and it, it was an old-ass school, and it was in a ghetto-ass area of the city. I mean, like, around it was just – it was just bad. I mean, it well, was – Yeah, it's not a good place. No, and then the it, it ended up – they built a brand-new middle school – I don't know, a half mile, mile away or something like that. And I ended up going over to that one and I had a starter jacket and I got jumped at school for my starter jacket. They didn't get it from me though, man. I was out on the playground and dude, I'm not, I, I cried, literally cried. And I held that thing. It was one of the old school button down ones. Yeah, and yeah. I had my arms like this, just held onto it, getting just pummeled, but they didn't get it from me. <laughs> my jacket. I, and just for the record, I did not snitch either. No, who, so, why would you? Yeah. But that was part of back in the day. That was part of growing up there. I remember getting chased at that school. I, I remember we basketball was really big. Yep. So remember we all like you had to have basketball moves. And I did a move on this guy and he was older. He didn't like it. So he <laughs> chased me down because I scored on him. And everybody was like, ooh, man, I ran until the bell rang. He chased me like for a good 10 minutes, man. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this dude was humongous. Had a big Jerry curl. Yeah. I mean, it was, it there was, was goons up there. Yeah, there were, there were goons. Exactly. Exactly. And so... You know, we did break dancing back then, man. We yep. did skateboarding. We did BMX bikes. We there was this field. We go out and make our own uh, tracks out there with a shovel, yeah. Did, yeah. Yeah. jumps, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, we, we had a lot of fun growing up. Yeah. And and here's one of the things when I talked about Marcus kind of being this leader of, uh, of the group of of guys we were in. Like we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, our parents were in the military. We lived in the Bay Area. You couldn't do a whole lot. But uh, kind of like when the first Jordans came out, or some of those old school shoes back then. Um, you know, we would get a pair 
and we'd use shoe polish. Uh, oh, man. We'd use shoe polish, like yeah, the, yeah. the liquid kind uh -huh. with the sponge, and we uh, would change yeah. the color of the shoes so you could wear them. Seriously, you'd, you'd make yeah. them a different color to wear them to school another day in a different color. Then you'd clean them back off and do another uh, one. That was just part of the shit you would do. Oh, my God. I forgot all about that, man. I remember uh, I bought some shoes from a kid at school because – my mom bought me some pro wings that look like the Michael Jordans. Oh, were they green? Warm? Oh man, no, they they were the ones like the first one that came out. So if you're from a distance, they look like Jordans. <laughs> but when you get up on them, you can see they have a little pro wing emblem. <laughs> man, I'm telling you, I got capped on so bad. I almost just walked around in socks that day. I was mortified, bro. Mortified, you no. know. And then after that, I'm like, I'll never wear a generic shoe in my life. Man, kids are vicious, and they were vicious during our era. I mean, it's not like today in school. You can't say anything about it. Oh, no. Kid. Oh, hell no. Much uh, less chase them around, take their starter jacket away from them. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 you, you know, you think about, I guess, you know, who knows what some of these other kids got into in life, I guess. But you look at, you know, what you've been through since then and, and how fucking big you are. And, I mean, I'm not as big and muscular, muscular as you, but I'm – you know, six foot four, 215 pounds. And you think back to these dudes that were oh, pumping yeah. on you back in the day. And now you're like, man, I like to find these dudes. <laughs> I want to find one of these little fuckers. Hey, when I see them on Facebook, people I went to school with, I'm like, man, you blow it out. I'll slap the shit out of you. Yo, <laughs> I won't even punch you. You're going to get a bitch slap. Yeah, I'm going to get a bitch slap, man. I'm going to get my little sister to hit you. <laughs> so you guys, uh, when did you guys part ways? I'm sure is it most... Most military families get moved around, so. Yeah. Yeah, it, it kind of sucked, man. I really didn't want to move. Um, my mom got a divorce, and so we had to move off base because my stepdad at the time, I, he got into some shit. He got kicked off the base. We had to get off the base, and my mom got divorced at the same time. So leaving the base um, put me into a situation in Sacramento where the area I moved in was in the hood, and my street was like, where a lot of the the, the, the dope dealers and the, the gangsters would hang out. So I was kind of like shot put it into an environment where it was this total contradiction to what I was used to, like skateboarding. There's no skateboarders in Sacramento, like black skateboarders or BMXers and all that stuff. So um, that threw me for a whole loop. And so Sean was still on base. I moved to Sacramento and I, I maintained staying out of trouble for a while. And then, um, you know, I just gradually got into shit, man, because it's just the, the neighborhood influence. How old were you? 14. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a tough age, man. Yeah. If you don't have a male role model, you know, somebody kind of guiding you and, you, you know, a lot of testosterone, you got girls, you're trying to fit in, you know, uh, and then Sacramento, a lot of bullies. I mean, dude, everybody had a big brother, everybody was, you know, strong and, you know, had street cred. And so, you know, going from the base to that neighborhood, I had to, I felt like I had to make a name for myself. So I just gradually, you know, kind of got into some shit. Okay. You know, and I was going to just kind of follow up on that, Marcus, just, you know, being in law enforcement and being with the gang unit for the number of years I was with and, and dealing with shootings and gangsters and, you know, blah, 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 guys that get in trouble. And that's one of the, the common things that everybody asks, you know, the public, well, what do we got to do to change this? How do we stop this? And, and I tell them, I said, man, the number one thing for these guys, the number one commonality is they grow without that positive uh, male figure. That's it. Yeah. Bottom line. I mean, that is it. You can't argue the, the numbers that's, you know, the statistics of it. And I'm, I'm not saying there aren't guys that have mom and dad at home that still get into the gangster world, but it is without a doubt kids that are growing up. It doesn't matter the neighborhood. It's no. if you're growing up in a household without that, that positive male figure in their life. And that's just, unfortunately the path that, uh, you know, so many of these kids go down. Um, I remember going out and seeing Marcus after he had moved out there to Sacramento and he was, you were a blood gang member. You know, I don't a remember crip. exactly what a crip. Yeah. North Highlands was crip. Oh, okay. Yeah. You were, you were a crip. That's right. And I remember you wouldn't say anything with a B that's what it was. That's what it was. <laughs> no, I'm dead ass serious. Cause really? so I, yeah, you know, and you know, what I, do you have breakfast? I have some breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> no, all B words were replaced with C's. I remember that. And so you uh, going had out clue, to see you had him clue, back then. Clueberry muffins. Yes, exactly. <laughs> clue Clary muffins. Wouldn't you? Yeah. So it was just, uh, you know, and that was kind of when, when, you know, I was like, fuck Marcus, he, he's out there for real. And then, 
Um, and, and you end up, like I said, ultimately going down uh, a path even as a teen that kind of landed you in some trouble. Yeah, it was. Uh, so I think I, when I seen you, bro, I had just, I was already selling drugs. Mm -hmm. That's um, what I remember you were selling drugs. I've been dope. in the hall once, and um, <clears throat> I was just in a bad place, man. I mean, I look at the kids now and I try to think of my mind state at the time. And, you know, when you, uh, you're trying to fit in in Sacramento, man, I mean, dude, you had guys my age already with four or five cars, you know, these guys were hustling. So, you know, I kind of looked up to that. And the fact that I didn't, you know, the, the males I had around me, like my uncles and stuff, I didn't really have a relationship with them. So, you know, the guys that I did kind of see were the guys in the neighborhood who were street guys even though I didn't want to be the guy drinking for you, hanging out, you know, smoking weed, I still wanted the money. And I feel, I felt like I can get that without getting caught up. So in essence, you know, once you touch that, it still, it pulls you in. So I just ended up getting into a lot of shit. Man, when you were up there banging, um, you know, you know, back then we didn't have, well, I don't know, man. I mean, shootings kind of really started popping off. I mean, I think if you look at like statistically the, the highest number of homicides, it is in that like 92, 93, somewhere in that range, like across the country. Um, you know, did you out there banging yourself? I mean, were you out there fighting everybody? Would get involved in shootings and shit like that, getting shot at? Or were you just kind of the <clears throat> dope game? Um, well, I got, uh, you know, I got jumped a couple times. Uh, you know, I, I remember summer school, um, with some blood rolled up on us and they basically, they had like, looked like a shotgun point out the window. And uh, that was my first time really looking like into the eyes of a gun and, and like dudes like, you know, blood, where are you from? Right. And I'm looking at the dude and like, dude, it's like literally he could have blew us, blew us up, blew our heads off. And I didn't you know, me and like two other guys, we didn't say anything. And that was at, I was 15. And so all those guys I was banging against at that time, when I went to juvenile hall, I seen him in juvenile hall and then boys ranch so now it's like everybody's kind of like grown into these gangster these gangster characters and as i went through juvenile hall and got out and then you know kind of got older then it became more serious and um you know i had a guy pull a uzi on me when i was 18 at a movie theater and um he didn't hit me but he hit you know a couple of people behind me he ended up doing i hurt 10 years but mm -hmm. i've been shot at a couple times damn so in the gang game, as you put it, you uh, ended up kind of, you, you weren't really in there to do drugs and shoot at people. You were in there more to hustle cash, right? Yeah, you know, I had a, I guess, you know, like Sean said, I, I had this vision and I kind of was uh, fascinated with mafia. So I'm thinking, man, what if I could start my own little crew? And, and, you know, but the problem was nobody in my, none of my friends were as serious or as intelligent as I was as far as like, business so you know you go out your friend's house and you try and talk to them and they're smoking weed and talking to girl you're like dude listen to what i'm saying so it got frustrating and i realized that i couldn't organize these guys because it wasn't nothing to organize and then as i kind of got more involved in the system i realized that the image that i had for trying to become this gangster slash mafia whatever guy was all bullshit because those guys would cross each other, no loyalty. Um, you know, they didn't care. It, it really, it was really glamorized, but it's bullshit. Right. And I, I kind of realized that, dude, there was no, there was no bond. I mean, people were setting up homies, were setting up each other to rob each other. You know, guys were backstabbing each other, sleeping each other's girls, stealing each other's drugs. I mean, it was just, it was just a shit show. Nothing's changed in that world. I'll tell you that, man. Uh, you know, just getting out of law enforcement just, just recently, nothing has changed. Well, yeah, what led you, uh, so you, after you've done this for a while, you uh, kind of came, you get, you got crossed with the law a little bit, went to juvie, but what was the big thing that got you incarcerated? Um, well, the big thing, man, eventually was a, a bank robbery, federal bank robbery in 2000. But before that, I went to, uh, I got caught up in a home invasion, giving a guy a ride, and I did two years, eight months for that. So juvenile hall, I you know, it's, you still have like these lingering, uh, I guess, uh, characteristics that you kind of, you know, carry and unless you kind of cut those off, they follow you. So you're still holding on to that street life, you know, it's still kind of 
So when I got out of juvenile hall, you know, I moved away, came back, and I still kind of had that street. And then even after doing time in CYA and um, fire camp, you know, um, I, you know, went to college a little bit, got into porn, and then I still had a street edge. I would still kind of do street stuff. Right, hold on, we're, we're, hold on. We're, we're hitting pause on this real quick. Pause. So first of all, for, for those that don't know, CYA is California Youth Authority. Um, it's kind of like the, the prison system for juveniles, essentially. And they, they do CYA up to what age? I know oh, beyond. I think I got there at 25 with Matt. Yeah, I think, I think 25, exactly. Um, so, you, so you did some time in CYA for the, your, your driving on this home invasion, right? Yes. And then you get out, and if I heard you correctly, you said college. something she about said oh yeah, college. You did say college, and, and, and I thought he said something about eating corn, cattle corn. Yeah, <laughs> or, but no. So you got into porn, so we can't just slide is by this that. Is, as a spectator, or is this <laughs> as a... well? You know, I, I was locked up from eighteen to twenty-one, and that's prime cheek busting era. You know, when you're hooking <laughs> up with all these girls. So my whole thing was, man, you know, being locked up. And during that time, I, I was bodybuilding and doing all this stuff. But I'm like, if I can get out and make money, you know, uh, doing porn, oh, man, I can be rich. I can, you know, catch up on all these women. <laughs> but um, it was a, it was the warp fantasy, man, because porn stars, they're broke. <laughs> so so, so you, just so you know, Howard is over here on the computer. He has Googled. Marcus Newhouse. What was your stage name? Yeah, oh, what, Big, Big Herc. Big Herc. What, what, you on, what, you're on a website I've never heard of. I thought everybody uses Pornhub. You're the one that pays for it. I don't pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so, so you got into this to help you get yourself <laughs> through college, right? Uh, well, you know, I got into it assuming that, uh, I don't know, when I was young, 21, I figured I'd get into it, have some fun, maybe start my own porn company, you know, and uh, build that into something. And, you know, you're just, I was just kind of just experiment, man. I didn't know what, I had no direction. I was in Southern California. I had a roommate and uh, we used to have all these girls, man, and we would have fun. And it was just like, you know, fantasy job, you know, but it wasn't paying. It wasn't like really paying the bills. Were you so was this something you guys were just filming doing on your own or were you actually? You know, I mean, I don't know how the hell that shit works. You show um, some company you know, an audition. I've seen lots it's, of it's crazy because um, initially <laughs> uh, I got out and then I got a job bouncing at a club in Newport beach. And then I found an ad back then. Everything was like, uh, these little newspapers. Oh yeah. Little dirty newspapers. <laughs> you yeah, you've been to Vegas, the, the free yeah, ones. And those little boxes. Yeah. So you put your little, you know, you get a free newspaper and it had a little ad in there. Uh, a, you know, adult star. I call the ad just like in the movies, but you went to one of these little shady spots off of Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood and had this little old guy with a beard, you know, he had a little office. His name is Ron like, Jeremy. Hey, <laughs> You know, he's like, hey, you want to get into the business? And he's like, yeah. He's like, okay, uh, let me see what you can do. You know, he shut the door, had a couple books. And he's like, let me know when you're ready. And then, like, I was ready like two minutes. Like, oh, okay. And, uh, you know, took a couple I've been minutes. in prison. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you know, he's like, hey, I'll give you a call. And I got a call within a week. And from there, um, it was just like, you know, full, full steam ahead. Full steam yeah, ahead. ahead is what he said. Yeah, there's some yeah that, that's nice. But you had okay, so you alluded to a um what got you really bound up was robbing a bank. I want to hear this story. I want to hear it start to finish this story. Um uh, well the bank robbery after the porn, after going to college, after you know, getting back into you know, selling weed, hustling, doing all kind of other crazy shit. Cause every time I went back to Sacramento, man, I kept getting into shit. Sacramento, I mean, dude, I was, it, it's, it was a cesspool for shit, man. So I, you know, going back to Sacramento, got into some stuff and then going back to LA, I would go back and forth. So I would do porn and then I would sometimes go to Sacramento and do other little stuff. And, um, some guys in the porn industry, one of the guys in the porn industry I knew was like, hit me up. He's like, Hey man, um, I got a lick, you know, would you be down? And a he's lick. Like, <laughs> he said, I know you're that's, a gangster. That's, that's a gangster term for a robbery. For a robbery, yeah. It got a lick. And I knew I shouldn't have, you know, something in my gut told me not to, but anyways, I went against my better judgment. These guys were kind of squares, and I ended up uh getting involved with a robbery. And um yeah, man, it, it was basically getaway car. We uh you know, planned it out, man. And dude, it was like a lot of signs in there. And I tell people all the time, there's a lot of signs that if you pay attention to it, it tell you it's no good. 
And one of the signs, the first sign was the one of the days when the guys went to go look at the bank, the driver and the other guy I robbed the bank with got into an argument about chocolate. The guy <laughs> wanted to pull over at the gas station because he needed chocolate. The driver's <laughs> like, man, we're not pulling over because we, we don't want to be seen in the area before the bank robbery. And they got to arguing about chocolate. And I'm looking at these two dudes like in a, it's like Reservoir Dogs. I'm like, dude, chocolate, what the hell? Both of y'all shut the hell up. I'm yeah. like, what are you talking about? So that was the first sign. These guys, it's like, I mean, come on, man. It's Laurel and Hardy. So after that, I'm like, damn, man. But I still kind of, you know, I shook it off. And then what's crazy, on the morning of the robbery, my mom called me. She never called me this early. My mom called me and asked me, what am I doing? And I'm sitting there waiting for these guys to pick me up. And I got like this goddamn fatigue stuff on and I got all this stuff and I'm ready, you know, getting ready to go hit traffic to go fucking do this robbery. And I'm like thinking, damn, man, why my mom called me this early? And that was another sign. And dude, uh, you know, that day, man, it was, it was the, the worst day of my life, bro. It's like, you know, raining, you know, the quiet ride to the bank, you know, uh, the guns in the car and, you know, you pull up to the bank and we're just, you're sitting there and, um, <clears throat> were you nervous? Hell yeah, man. My, you know, chest, my heart is beating out of my chest, but then I just, I just said, F it, man. I jumped off the car, put the mask down and ran up in there, you know, and the dude followed me and, um, it's like slow mo. Everything was slow motion. You see everything like, you know, in the movie, they try to make it seem glam, man, that shit is, Dude, it's like you're looking around. It's like time stops. And you're thinking like, you know, what am I do? You're what am I doing? But I'm I'm already in it. It's like a movie, you're playing it out. You're like, you don't even know how it's gonna play out. You don't know if a guy in there is, you know, a cop and he's un, you know, um and, he, and he's in and he's in civilian clothing. You don't know if they're gonna shoot, you don't know what's going on, and you're just playing it out, and it's like, dude, it's it just was a it's a crazy experience, man. And it's nothing I would I'm bragging about or trying to say, hey, man, it's because rappers make it seem like it's glorious. Dude, it was it was crazy, man. It went up in there and and the dude is, you know, the, my, the, the guy who was my partner jumped over the counter. He's, you know, trying to get him to give him the money and he's panicking and then he, he hit somebody. And I look out the window in the corner of my eye. I see like, you know, some sheriffs in a, in a raincoat and a shotgun. I'm like, dude, this is a wrap. And I'm like telling him to hurry up. And it's like, he's in there way too long. We run out. It's one of the banks where I have the drive through. You go around and he ran out the other side and we pull out. And as soon as we pull on the street, a cop happened to be behind us. and He bumps us from behind. The and cop bumped you guys? Cop bumped us, right? Like the timing was impeccable. He, we're leaving, pulling out into the street and he bumps us. And we look in the rear view and it's like, he knows it's us. And we, we're in a four door uh escort ford escort and you no know, it's a speedy car the escort oh my god man we pull out right. and oh. we, we go down the street and basically pull into this little parking lot and there's nowhere to go and he like he, he gets off the car and he draws down on us and i'm like oh my god this shit is over already man this is crazy and he's like get out the car get out the car and and, and the, my the driver guns it he guns it because we have another getaway car, Lincoln Navigator, in this little like industrial area, like a little little uh, shopping area. So we pull in there, dish the car, dish the clothes, get into the Navigator, and there's cops everywhere now. There's probably 30, 40, 50 cops. We pull out in the Navigator, and as we pull out, we see all the cops, and they look at us, three black guys, they look at us. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, like... What the hell are you doing over here? You didn't fucking and, lay down in there, man. Come on, hey, dude. I'm, but we're look, we're leaning back, and I mean, it's obvious. Like they got the area, they got a, a, a circumference around the area. So from there is high speed chase, and I mean, we're in a navigator, dude, on the freeway, one hundred and one. It's raining, uh, helicopter, cop trail. Uh, eventually, they throw a spike strip. They run over the spike strip. We roll on rims for I don't know how long. And then uh, the car stops. As soon as the navigator stops, I jump off the car like, like um, Usain Bolt. I jump over the freeway divider, run across four lanes of traffic. I'm trying to find somewhere to go hide. They send a canine unit. The canine, I guess, comes in there and secures the other two guys. And they catch me on like 
the boardwalk by the beach and, you know, five cops arrest me and I'm on the, the last thing I see was the, the ocean and just the sun, I'm the sunrise and I'm looking like this is the last time I'm going to see this in a long time. Man, so so when you go into the bank, uh, you were armed? Yeah. What'd you have? Uh, it was like a... Um, it was a, it was like a, a mini assault rifle, like a, what a, like a eight clip, some like a little generic military rifle. I got you. And your partner that jumped over the counter, what did he have? I have it. Well, actually it was the M1 carbine I had and he had a nine. All right. And he ended up hitting somebody, pistol whip him or just hit, punch him. I think he hit him upside the head. So that was another charge. I got you. And then when, when you guys, when you bail out the, the high speed escort that you chose, was that a <laughs> stolen car? Um, no, those were all, uh, through, uh, Rent, rental car agencies. <laughs> and whose name? Please don't tell me oh, one of the three. No, no, no. He had fake, he fake IDs, everything. Okay, okay. Thank you. So, you, so you, you, you get out the escort. Did you dump? Did you guys leave the guns there? Or did you take the guns? No, no. Left the guns and everything. The only thing we had were like a couple bags of money. Okay. How much you guys get out with? You know? Yeah, a hundred something thousand peanuts. A hundred something. That's yeah. pretty good. Now, that's a good lick, though. Like Ninety-eight, man. maybe one hundred and ten. It wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, it wasn't nothing crazy. Yeah, not worth going to prison over. But I mean, no. that's a good lick, though. But your buddy that was in there in the actual bank with you, he was he was robbing the bank for a particular reason. He needed money, obviously. But what did he need money for? Well, that guy, he was actually before when I first met him, he wasn't a bad dude. He was like he wanted to be an actor, so he was like um, he was kind of like a a player type dude from France, spoke French, spoke, uh, you know, had a real dapper, great actor. He wanted to be Robert De Niro. And so, uh, you know, he was robbing it, I think more or less because he believed in me because he looked up to me and, um, you know, he figured if I'm involved, then, you know, it, it gives it some type of uh, validity. But like I said, the sad thing is that guy, as soon as he went to jail, went crazy. Did he? He went crazy, man. He, he the dude. Uh, he went crazy, and he did majority of his time in the middle ward. Huh. Now, and now is he? And, and I mean, I obviously know your the, some of the story to this. Is he the one that ended out? I think what on Skid Row and ended up. Getting, yeah. Okay, man. Yeah. Uh, what kind of uh, you know had a, a sad ending there? I guess. Yeah, he got shot five times. LAPD. Yeah. So what? What's the story on that? So he gets out of well, prison. He's had obviously mental health issues. The, the thing is, when, after we got locked up and then, um, you know, they, you know, do your little interrogation, whatever, he, he told the whole story, but then he felt bad after he told. So he was offered a deal for seven years and because it was the first offense, he turned the deal down and he felt guilty. So he went to trial. He went to trial, assuming that he could say he made all that up oh, and wow. the judge gave him the max, but the judge gave him like, 20 something 20 years and he ended up doing like 15 but he had got to the point where he wasn't showering in prison his skin broke out he got really like dudes wanted to beat him up in there you know like he just lost it and um he got out and um i happened to be watching the news one day and my wife's like hey look at this this guy looks like the guy you knew and they said uh this guy he he got out never really checked into his probation and he was living on the streets, man. And, um, you know, I guess got into a scuffle with the, the police on Skid Row, man, and uh, got killed, you know. Mm. And so, how, how, how about yourself? Uh, I mean, did you end up taking your shit to trial or did you just oh, man no. up? Yeah. No, I had, had 100 pages of the discovery, man. I seen that it wasn't like anything. So I basically took the deal, but I did research to knock off some time at my sentencing because I realized that my – uh, public pretender wasn't really going to do any homework. So I did some homework for myself and I knocked off a couple years at my sentencing. Your public pretender. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great band. That is. <laughs> so you ended up in jail. What, what did you use that time in jail to reform yourself? Did you decide that, Hey, this gang life ain't for me. I am not such a good criminal. Oh yeah. And, I and mean, but Marcus for you answer that, did you do fed time? I mean, it was a bank robbery. Yeah. Yeah. I did fed time. So, um, Fed is a different in the state. State is a lot more racial and political, even though the Feds is too. But in the state, Feds, you have a lot of guys, I mean, cartel, mafia, you know, guys who are, you know, major bank robbers, guys who are money oriented. So actually, when I got locked up, I made a point right then to stop socializing with the guys I did the bank robbery with. So I kind of broke off from them and I started studying. I started looking for answers to how I got in this position, you know. What was the thing that led to me even entertaining a bank robbery? How could I entertain something that 
that damn crazy. So I did a spiritual, a whole spiritual like uh, uh, journey and, and I started studying the law and I was helping people in a law library and I did all these other things, man, and created these groups in prison where we study and, and do these different activities together. And so I kind of like went on my own path, man. And because of the way I cured myself, um, you know, I avoided a lot of drama and I also, you know, a lot of guys hated on me because of how, you know, how I articulated myself and because I wasn't hanging out telling war stories or I wasn't this guy, you know, I was, I was on my own little thing, man. So I, I was pretty solo in the, in the, you know, penitentiary. Well, what was your sentence? How long were you in there? Uh, I got 120 months. So that's 10 years. And I did eight years, eight months off of that. So you were in there a while. That was your prime oh, man, time. Long time. Where, where, where did you get sent to? I mean, obviously, you can go anywhere in the country, part of the Fed process. Um, the first place I was at, I went to Lompoc USP because I had a previous record. So my points were high initially. And Lompoc, bro, they call it the castle. The USP, I mean, dude, you got guys in there who ain't ever getting out. I mean, right. it, it's like uh, Carmine Persico was there. The head of the Colombo crime family was there in the same unit. There were big, big drug dealers from like, uh, DC, who they had to ship them all the way out here because these guys had too much influence. I have on the to East go to the restroom, I mean, so we're going to play. There's guys there with right you know here. two, three lives in a hundred years. I mean, crazy time, man, crazy time, and everything in there was super serious. I mean, you had to be able to read people. You had the the guards were gangsters. They called the guards the cowboys. Long Park, I mean, literally the guards at night would come in there, take dudes out their cell, beat dudes ass. I mean, it was no joke, man. I mean. And you had guys in there who were serious. There was an inmate before I got there who strapped up two knives to his hands and started stabbing guards. They had to shoot him on the compound. I mean, this guy just said he just went out. He's like, they said he came out to chow hall and they told him to get against the wall. And he had two knives where he just basically, he, he was, it was, it was an all or nothing for him. And this is before I got there. So, I mean, there was a lot of just murders, stabbings. It was it, Long Park USP was a vicious place. How long were you there before you end up getting moved uh, somewhere else? They dropped my points. I was there for roughly almost two years, like 19 months or 20 months before they transferred me. When you say they dropped your points, what's that mean? They figure out you, you um, out of trouble? Yeah, my uh, my uh, my level, they have different levels in which you're being housed at dropped. So once your points level dropped, they got to move you down to a lesser, um, I guess, a, a more minimum security institution. So I went down to a medium and Sheridan, and Sheridan was like, uh, it was like a college campus compared to Lompoc, man. It was a whole nother, you know, a whole nother vibe. But um, yeah, I left there. And I was nice hotels, man. That's a nice hotel, Sheridan. Yeah, no, not this one. Ain't yeah. that one. <laughs> not that one. Yeah, so you ended up, uh, so you did your whole time in there and you kind of recouped yourself, right? Yeah. You rehabilitated, you came out more positive on the outside, you stayed positive on the inside, and then you maximized that when you got out, correct? Yeah, yeah. With, with the whole time I was in there, um, I basically treated every day as though if I got out early, what would I do? So that kind of kept me going as far as uh, just like living, creating that fantasy. So I never became institutionalized. You know, I never played prison basketball, prison um you know a softball or dominoes i didn't get involved in that because i didn't want to become a guy that made that 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 became a reality like normal right. everything about prison to me was not normal the inhumanity the way people treat each other the cutthroat the the, the you know the people the the way they view life you know the anger the you know so i had to really fight that it's not the, the physical part I wasn't really worried about it's the mental man. If you let mentally prison break you down, man, you can, you'll lose it. I mean, most of the guys in prison are on, on heroin, that's the biggest drug in there. A lot of these guys, shot callers, guys, people look up to they're drug addicts, mm -hmm. hmm. man. So when, so when you get out, um, like I said, obviously you talked about her a few minutes ago, you're married, you became this big influencer on social media. You've got a couple of your own companies going now, you know, how did all that steamroll and you know, what are you doing these days? Um, well, I came up with the concept fresh out when I was in prison, walking the track, I kind of, you know, I wanted to do something, produce a show that can show people in a positive light, like what could happen if you actually do something positive with your jail time and come out and be a positive, like role model for kids. So I focused on interviewing people who had changed their life. And one of my first guys I interviewed was Cali Muscle. He's really big on YouTube right now. 
And then I started interviewing other guys. And then I, I, you know, my partner who I met at the gym when I was still at the halfway house, we've been friends for like over 10 years. And um, he, he, you know, we, we put our money together and just started filming. We didn't know what we were doing, but we know we want to start a show and the show just kind of steamrolled from there, man. I started doing, um, we started getting emails. Could we create a website, start selling t-shirts, um, started selling protein powder, pre-workout, um, and just, uh, it, it just, the brand just grew organically. We've never paid for any type of marketing. We just kept it honest. And one of the things that was making our channel different is we never glorify and we don't, you know, we kind of stay away from like a lot of the, the ignorance, which kind of makes us seem more people, you know, say a oh, big hurt, you're a sellout. Oh, big hurt, you're, you're, you know, you're this or that, because I don't, I don't entertain the dumb stuff because I know what it is. It's, it's stupid, man. You're not, you don't have to be, uh, you, you know, you don't have to act a certain way in order to be um, legitimized. You could be articulate. You could be somebody who has goals. You could be somebody who, God damn it, plays the trumpet. It doesn't mean that you're weak or you're soft, you know? No, for real. You know, I was just having this conversation or a similar type of conversation recently with somebody talking about some of these gangsters. And it's like, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these guys that look up to whether it's gangster rappers or the athletes and stuff like that. And I'm like, man, you could legitimately go out and be a, be a fucking plumber and make a good yeah. living. I yeah. mean, seriously, just yeah. like you talking about be a, you know, a, a trumpeter or a trumpeteer, whatever the term is. But I mean, you could go out and, and, and be a plumber or an electrician or, you know, working in an HVAC oil or oil field. I mean, there's all yeah. kinds of jobs yeah. out there. That a lot of them are just trade jobs or something. You can make a good living and never have to look over your shoulder again. You don't have to worry about the police. You don't have to worry about other yeah. gangsters. You don't have to worry about getting ripped off for, you know, the dope you're selling or your money or whatever it is. And it's just, uh, you know, trying to get guys to understand that. And, and, you know, when you're 15 to 23, 24, you make stupid decisions. That's I mean, pe people do stupid shit. You do. But at some point, you grow up or you have to grow up, but just like you're saying, you don't, you know, legitimize and, and, uh, glorify that life. Um, especially as you get older, you, cause you don't want to see other youngsters follow that same path. Yeah. I think, um, and I think gradually as, uh, you know, as you build a brand and young people can see, cause anything the youngsters claim they did, I've done it, dude. I, I, I'm not a fantasy bank robber. I'm not a fantasy drug dealer, fantasy game. I mean, dude, I've done it. I, I'm not bragging about it. I'm not trying to say you should do it to become, so it doesn't make you anybody. I wish I would have never done a lot of this stuff. Sure. You know, um, it's, it's, it's like, why did I hurt my family, man? I, I mean, my mom, man, she was, she was tore up. You know what I mean? I mean, dude, I hurt a lot of people, man, that I didn't think that I hurt because I didn't touch them, but I hurt them. So when I see these kids and dude, I used to, I used to ride around a Sacramento with a 380. I had a 380. I was already, I mean, dude, I kept it under my seat, my cougar. And I'm like, you know, if there's a problem, I just dump on a dude. I didn't even question, you know, I was a gangster. But it's like, you see gangster, and because I talk with a list, I'm kind of articulate. And I, people look at me and they're like, oh, my God, you don't, you know, I've had guys tell me, you, the way you talk, I would have never assumed a person like you could have done what you did because you don't appear to be, because now you're looking for the guy who's sagging, the guy who's running around with the grill, whatever. Dude, that's fake. That's fake. And until you be honest with you, that's a false reality. You're selling these kids, man, these kids that are buying into, they got to get an unregistered gun to go do something. I'm like, do why? So I'm trying to tell kids, look, man, like you said, HVAC, plumbing, uh, welding, fabrication, engineering, painting auto body. Dude, you could be, you can be a millionaire. You can, there's so many different things. And one time you get to prison, now you're trying to work for honey buns. You're yeah. hustling. <laughs> You're drawing art for honey buns and making little little trinkets. I mean, come on, man, do that shit on the street. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And you know, you kind of just talked about paint and body, and you know, you're big into cars. You know, yeah, that's a big passion of yours right now, right? Yeah, yeah, cars, man. I mean, I used to have a subscription to Hemings, man, and it was like looking at porn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would look through all the pages in there and be like, man, if I was on the street, I'd buy this, I'd buy that, you know. <laughs> What's, what's the dream car you got right now? What is it if you get your oh, hands man. on? I, I got a wide body 928 Porsche I've been working on for, man, years because I got ripped off a couple of times. It's almost, it'll be done by next year, probably March, April. 
and it's going to be just ridiculous. I got a Chevelle, a 72, that's a monster. It's going to be about 800, 900 horsepower. Damn. Um, what kind of transmission you put in there? You're going to twist um, that out. I got a four, uh, four L80E that's all billet. So yeah. um, built up. I got a um, LQ9 with all uh, forge crank, uh, custom rods, um, uh, Elderbrock E4 supercharger. Um, I'm going to run E85. I'm actually due to... I'm going to do the silver states with that car. So I'm going to run it for hundred miles per hour at uh, at least hundred miles. So, um, you know, cars is my thing. That's like my, it's my drug. I don't get high. You know, I used to chase a lot of ass. So now cars is like my, my rush. Absolutely. Well, Hey, this has been highly interesting. I, I told you this thing would fly, man. We are literally out of time. That's how fast oh, wow. this thing goes by. Yeah. Seriously, man. I mean, we got a, we got a, you know, a 47 minutes and we're at 46 30 oh, right man. now. So we're wrapping this bad boy up. Yeah. We need some more of your friends to come on. I know, man. Well, no, you know, we'll, we'll close it out with this is, uh, like I said, Marcus and I have again, known each other since our kids. And it's so funny growing up out there in the Bay area and literally you could have flipped a quarter right now. And it could have been Marcus that became the cop. <laughs> no, I'm serious. And, and me know, being the know. back, you know, the knucklehead. I mean, literally, it's a decision or two yeah. away, you know, for, for both of us back in that age on what path we would have could have gone down. And um, and I think because of that, how similar we growing up, just mentality and stuff like that is why you were able to go into the gangster world, but yet come back out and have this normal yeah. ass life now, and vice versa. I think growing up out there like that is what helped me be a really, you know, uh, a, a, the good cop that I was, so to speak, I guess. I mean, I understood the gangster world and that was why I enjoyed working that area. And I don't know if I'd say, you know, I had a lot of sympathy, I guess, for guys that, that got into that shit and understood it dealing with the kids rather than, you know, a cop who'd never been around it. And all of a sudden you're, you're trying to chew out some 18 year old kid. Why aren't you in college? Why aren't you doing anything with your life, man? I mean, you know, it's just a little bit different. So, well, Marcus, brother, here's to you. We we haven't drank much of this shit. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it, it was a lot better when I was 16, there's 17. A, there's about 23 ounces mm-hmm. left in here. I'm going to have to uh, hook up with you, man, in, in person. I want to go for riding that Cadillac. Come on, man. Hey, Come Cam, on. Hey, I'm, I'm looking for a uh, – I want a 64 – Triple, I'm gonna just murder it out. Just black on triple black continental. That's my new one. Hard top. That's what I'm going That's for now. Pretty That's what we're going for now, brother. We're gonna just drop this off, but don't hop off. We'll chat some more. <laughs>